Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the July Biostrategy Partners Practical Knowledge Series panel. Today's topic is planning to scale from the start, how to lay a foundation that will facilitate the growth of your life sciences company. We're very pleased to have you in the audience join us and to have a really fantastic expert panel for you today. Our sponsors are MVM Associates and Cesare Raviz Intellectual Property Firm. We also, on occasion, have these Practical Knowledge Series panels um, when conditions allow at University Place Associates. So as always, we thank all of our sponsors. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our participating moderator, Niall Sweeney. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to be with you today. Um, so I thought we'd kick off, maybe the, the panelists would first uh, introduce ourselves, and then, um, We've got a couple of topics in mind, which uh, we often get questions about, and we can sort of talk about those among ourselves and also take some questions. Um, I guess by way of introduction, uh, I'd say I, I am the CEO of MedTech Junction, um, which is a company that helps uh, startups get started, helps them get funded, and uh, helps them execute to uh, hopefully a successful exit. Um, but most of my career has actually been in large medical device corporations uh, where I developed a number of successful medical devices um, in a variety of markets, including syringes, needles, uh, diabetes, orthopedics, and uh, dental. Um, so I, I've been through the process a number of times, um, and I feel I've sort of learned what does and doesn't work through kind of the school of hard knocks, so to speak. Um, which is what prompted me, uh, by and large, to, uh, to, to start MedTech Junction, um, because I feel that a lot of the people in these early stage startups, particularly if they're doing it for the first time, uh, they might they may have great ideas, uh, but I think that I can bring some of the learnings from my ex experience to bear. Um, so that's probably enough for me. Um, Naomi, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So hello everybody, thank you again for joining us. Um, I'm Naomi Baer and I'm a business development consultant with um, Millipore Sigma. Um, and I've been with Millipore for um, over 25 years. Um, and just so to be clear, Millipore Sigma is a life science organization of Merck, KJA, Darmstadt. So we're like 350 years old. Um, and that being said, we have uh, uh, over like 300,000 products and services, et cetera. We have a lot of experience. Um, and I personally have had a lot of experience in the pharma and biotech industry, um, where, you know, we've worked with startups as well as global strategic huge uh, accounts. And we help to, to support them and get their products to market and, um, you know, to help the healthcare industry. So I really look forward to this is a really important um, subject. And uh, as you know, Niall mentioned, there's a lots of uh, uh, learning along the way, a lot of hurdles, and it's a great opportunity to like learn from the panel and connect with us. And with that, um, I pass it over to Bob. Hi, all. It's a pleasure to be with you and get to uh, spend the lunch hour. Uh, speaking about this important subject. I started off many years ago in medical research focusing on immunology and infectious disease uh, with an emphasis on cardiac transplants and then spent uh, two and a half decades uh, in charge of science and engineering for a Fortune 30 multinational conglomerate. Uh, and I had during that time the opportunity to work on many startups as well as um, acquisitions ranging from uh, very small ones up to a billion dollars in size. Uh, then I went, did a stint in academia, and now I'm in the midst of doing a new startup uh, where we're focusing on some patent and technologies that we have for the attenuation of the COVID-19 virus. So I've come full circle back to the uh, medical applications. And again, looking forward to uh, having a, uh, a conversation with y'all today. All right, so um, uh, the first topic that we thought we'd uh, talk a little bit about is uh, 
you know, this this notion that we should begin with the end in mind. And uh, when we were discussing this with panelists, we realized that um, kind of the, the happy ending for uh, life science companies um, uh, may vary depending a bit on what the company is. Uh, the, the happy ending may vary and the, the path to it. Um, but for my part, I guess I'd uh, kind of limit my comments to um, uh, medical device startups. And I think kind of basically, uh, the first thing I would emphasize is that I think that an exit is a good thing and that that is the appropriate happy ending for most uh, startups. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that, uh, not least of which is that um, obviously uh, you, you want the technology to be widely adopted. And, um, and in order to achieve that, uh, you need to be able to acquire a lot of customers. Uh, typically, just the, 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 the economics and the time it would take for um, a small startup to acquire adequate customers, it, it's generally too long and too expensive. Whereas um, a corporate partner um, generally has that capability and can do it faster. And because um, the customer acquisition cost is spread over a large bag of products, they can do it more efficiently. Um, so I, I often get sort of nodding heads when I point that out, that an exit is, is a good thing. Um, Sometimes members of startups are puzzled as to why do they need to think about this right at uh, right at the start. Uh, generally, they've, um, they've they've 101 things to do that they really need, need to be thinking about something that's not going to happen for you know maybe four or five years. And um, I would say consider this that uh, if you're raising money from um, a private investor, uh, that investor is going to be very interested in the um, in the exit, um, I, it, it, I mean, it, for a variety of reasons, but it's, it's certainly essential for the investor if they have any chance of getting the money back, um, they need to have an exit. So they need to have a high level of comfort that the startup is indeed going to exit. And one way that you can convey that is to have a well thought out plan to get to that exit. Um, and those plans often uh, actually look a little bit different than some other startups where maybe the goal is to um, grab market share or to try to drive revenue to the point where you achieve break even. Uh, if your goal is to get acquired, um, the steps you take along the way often look a little bit different. So it's good to have those identified early so that when you're raising money, you can uh, cre credibly talk to that. So let me draw a breath there and let my fellow panelists weigh in on this topic. Yeah, and, and just a, a, an addition to that is, in looking ahead to what your your end goal is, it can help you in the very beginning to structure what those partnering arrangements might look like, who you're going to partner with. And again, look at it from a strategic standpoint that in four to five years, that may be the partner that ends up being the exit for you. And it's the same way with licensing if you go that route. So those things help to actually dictate some of the steps that you'll take in your initial uh, uh, activities. I guess, and, and you know, I agree with all that. That being said, you know, for a biologic, a therapeutic, or um, any kind of uh, molecule, the longer the um, you nurture that that process, that molecule, and you really, you know, show a lot of data and show the efficacy and um, move it along, the more equity you'll get into that. Um, so it's, you know, a lot of people say, well, I just want to, you know, move it along and have somebody acquire it. But at the same time, you have to balance out and, and see if you can um, improve on it and work on it, because then overall, you're going to get a lot more out of that. Yes, but again, there is that that fine line as you choose these right. because you also have those intellectual properties that have a finite life to them. Now, within pharma pharmaceuticals, there's some opportunities to do some more things, but typically you have that 20 year clock that's ticking. And so you also have to be cognizant of that because that can affect the value uh, if you're right. 10, 15 years into it. 
Yeah, I guess uh, we're talking, I'm used to talking a lot sooner than that, but yes, shorter period. Do we have um, any questions or comments from the, the audience on this? Not at this time, no, thank you now. Okay, if we do, we can maybe circle back later. Um, so why don't we move on a bit? Um, uh, the other topic we, we thought we would uh, uh, touch on, which is sort of a foundational topic, is um, I, IP and patents. Um, Bob, do you, do you maybe want to share some thoughts on that? Yeah, so again, this is a, a, a critical route for it. And one of the things, just going back to as you're setting up your uh, the initial team for your startup and looking at the uh, resources that you're going to br uh, bring to bear on it, uh, a patent attorney is going to be critical. And how you can optimize those dollars uh, becomes very important. So just looking at the very first part of it filing for patents, um, some large law firms uh, will actually offer to startups um, little, um, I guess the best way to say it, uh, cash incentive. So they'll give you a, um, uh, a credit of X number of dollars to go towards their legal fees. And of course, their reason for doing this is that they're hoping in the long run, you will be needing uh, much more legal uh, assistance, and so this will build to something. Um, they're cognizant that many startups uh, will not make it to that point, but trying to hit um, out of the, some of those that they do a home run, so eventually they'll be able to recoup their funds back. But again, with so many of these things, as you're initially doing the startup, try to optimize without bringing resources necessarily in. And so the uh, the intellectual property is a critical one. One other quick comment on that is how you structure that IP is very important. You have to make it stringent enough that you can prevent others from coming in and doing something similar. And yet at the same time, you don't want to be too, inconclu too conclusive that um, it precludes you from, it narrows your range too much. I think I just wanna jump in about the intellectual property. I think that's a really important aspect um, and that as you start to, uh, you know, make partnerships and work and collaborate with different vendors, different groups, different entities, that you should really protect um, your intellectual property there's a lot of um, even basic forms online. I know as a vendor, we offer standard forms to protect uh, our clients' um, you know, focus also for us and because we collaborate very deeply. Um, so that's a really good starting point. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's something that you should be you know, really aware that it's out. It's very, you don't have to go to all the big legal firms to start off with. But those are good starting points. Great. And, and of course, you need, I'm sorry, but one of the things as you're doing this, make sure that you've developed a very clear NDA um, so that prior to providing all this information to what could be a competitor uh, or to the people that are going to provide financing, make sure you have a very uh, good NDA in place with those groups. I guess what I would add to that, um, I guess picking up on a point that Bob made with regard to, um, uh, you know, the initial filing of patents, I, I certainly agree that there needs to be um, uh, legal involvement in it. Um, I personally, I, I find sometimes with IP and patents, it can um, become an area that it's, uh, it's difficult to see the forest for the trees. Um, and I, I think one thing, one thought to hang on to is that the, uh, the value of a patent is really kind of, from a business point of view, is linked to um, the degree to, to which it gives you market ex exclusivity. Um, and sometimes in the kind of the heat of all the details, that can get a bit, little bit lost. Um, I think uh, one sort of shortcut is to um, uh, certainly focus on the planes 
um, like the actual wording of the claims that you're trying to get. And, you know, sometimes you read claims and they look like a description of the product that you have in your mind. Um, but the goal is not to provide a good description of your product. Uh, the goal is actually to make it very difficult for somebody else to provide an alternative. Yes. Um, and I, I've, I've seen teams which, um, they, the phrase they used was they red teamed it, where they had one group of uh, people try to propose a claim and a second group of people try to navigate around the claim. And after they did that once or twice, they realized that there were subtle ways that they could change a few words in the claim that would make it a lot stronger. Um, so I feel like, well, there's a lot going on in patents. Uh, I think it behooves the inventors and, and, and members of the startup certainly to understand their claim and understand how that links to market uh, ex exclusivity. Um, as I think that future investors and future acquirers are definitely going to want to um, understand that and they look to see that the team understands what their secret sauce really is. And one of the other aspects to IP is, especially early on for many startups, this is the value of the company. Uh, the, this could be extremely valuable. And so how you leverage then that going forward is important. And again, looking at, do you license some of these technologies? Um, do you look to recoup so much pennies on the dollar back from uh, what you're being a what you have patented for the uh, technology? So again, this is a critical element of any type of a startup organization. I think I think one of the the things that we talked about was, you know, how do you differentiate yourself? from what else is out there. How is your molecule, how is your uh, product um, different from that? And you're right, I think that is a key point of um, bringing the value of what you're bringing you know, to, to the market. So that's important. Yes. We have a question from the audience, if you wouldn't mind. It comes from Erica and she would like to know, um, could you please describe the difference between a trade secret and a patent? Um, let, let me take a crack at that. It'll be a simplistic one. Um, I think the basic difference is that a trade secret obviously is a secret. So you don't share it with anybody and that way you, you have a, exclusivity. Um, I guess the, uh, the formula for Coca-Cola is a trade secret. Yeah, that comes to mind, yes. Um, I think the deal with a patent is that um, in, ex in exchange for having the right to exclude other people from practicing your invention. Uh, what the patent necessarily gives the secret away. It explains what it is that you're doing and why it's novel. And I guess the phrase they use is there needs to be an enabling disclosure. So like you really have to cough up what your secret sauce is. Uh, but in exchange for that, you get the um, uh, basically the government backs you that you have uh, exclusive right to that for the uh, life of the patent. And another question in this arena, Alessandro asks, could you please uh, give us a sense of the costs for patent protection? Oh, that's a good question. So and now you'll probably want to go more details, but uh, just to do a provisional patent. And again, there's different types of patents, but a provisional, uh, you could be looking at typically $10,000. And that's for a very, that buys you a year. Uh, while you're filing your your other patents, Al, do you want to comment on the uh, some of the total costs involved? Yeah, I um, uh, let me do what I can. So I agree, the provisional patent um, can be relatively low cost, and and I've actually seen them get turned around in like a week. Uh, mm -hmm. So like that, as Bob put it, that sort of puts your foot in the door, and then you have a year to kind of um, get serious about it. I think um, once you start uh, prosecuting a patent, which is you know this process where the, uh, your attorney basically argues back and forth um, with the uh, various patent offices, um, the bill can start to run up pretty quickly. Um, you know, bills of like, 
and it's hard to put a put a boundary on it because um, it depends how much arguing happens, right? Yes. Um, and I think as a startup, uh, if you license the technology and are funding this, um, it's like a lot of your other expenses. You have to manage it. Um, I, I would not say that you know you pay whatever it takes. Um, I think you got to prioritize which claims you really care about and which are nice to have. Um, and I also think the other area that people can quickly run up costs and maybe not get a lot for it is figuring out which um, geographic regions they want to file in. Um, obviously, some parts of the world are very populous, but uh, the IP is not very, <clears throat> uh, very well enforced. So the, uh, the, the, the value of a prosecute patent there might not be that um, high. But certainly, um, you know, to, to actually get a patent in several regions uh, fully prosecuted, um, uh, by the time it actually issues, you, you'd certainly be talking the region of $100,000. Yes. And at the university that I'm affiliated with, uh, they will routinely file provisional patents for researchers at the uh, institution. but once it gets to that next step, because of those, uh, what could be exorbitant costs, they'll typically look then, can that uh, be partnered out to someone who feels um, that uh, they could justify the cost that's going to go into that? So we find that the, um, the population of provisional patents then decreases considerably just because of the uh, costs that it's going to take to uh, to put in a formal patent. Another hey, Bob, related question. I'm sorry, please, Naomi, Bob, go ahead. I just, I just want to add, I think you brought up a, a really good point of looking at if you are uh, in, in an academic environment, look at your tech transfer um, facilities from the universities. They offer a lot of guidance, um, you know, as well as, you know, the associations like the bio strategy partners and reaching out to um, you know people to get more input on that and guidance. So a related question, Michelle asks, given the cost of patent prosecution, how does one go about determining which countries to pursue XUS? Yeah, so I, I, I've um, I struggled a little bit with this in the past. Um, and I mean, the, the, the two main criteria that seemed to me to be reasonable to apply was um, if you can sort of ballpark what the amenable market is in the various regions. Um, it seems like certainly in med tech, like the US and Europe always seem to be on the short list. Um, but beyond there, uh, you know, there, there may or may not be um, uh, like a robust market, um, at, at least a, uh, right, a, a, an accessible market. There, there may be lots of population and people with the uh, ailment that, that you're addressing, but the, um, the potential to actually sell into those markets might be a lot less. Uh, the other thing then I think is um, you know, different regions of the world, they enforce uh, patents uh, with different levels of rigor. And um, I think, uh, I, I know from a time in industry that uh, IP in China was sort of often discounted because it didn't seem to actually, uh, I think in China, you'd rather have a trade secret than a patent. Yes. Yes, we found from experience, since we worked on every continent but in Antarctica, and there are certain regions of the world where we just would not file patents. It, uh, it was, in essence, we were giving away uh, the technology. And so we chose to use it as a, a trade secret at that point. Okay, so maybe we can... Uh... Yeah, I guess we can move on to, you know, discussing a little bit more about development and um, and the scaling and 
the aspect of that and how important it is from the beginning. Yeah, sorry, I had a little trouble hearing you. Um, oh. Naomi, did, were you talking about you um, the, 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 you know, the decisions around whether to outsource or in source? Yeah, I think it's really important. I think um, overall, it's good to have, like you mentioned, um, a good exit strategy, but also to have uh, an overall plan of, of how you see your therapy molecules device where it's going to go and then from there you can build that path and um and maybe different options on on how to go um i know you had discussed uh, a lot of that uh you know options to outsource and how much to develop in and i think those are really good topics to to discuss right i i know on the can you hear me, can you hear yes. me right? okay i can at any rate um, I know it's certainly in the device world, um, it is often actually quite feasible to uh, outsource a lot of the development work. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't say there's hard and fast rules about this, but I, I, I'm attracted by the concept of outsourcing if for no other reason than, um, you know, like the startup path often um often has to undergo a major overhaul and when that happens uh you know you might have to change the kind of uh, skills and resources that you need working um on your uh, on your product so that's more easily done if you've actually outsourced a lot of the work because you know you can basically stop working with one vendor and find a different one um the, the, the one thing though maybe it's kind of a danger is that um you know, even if you do work with very reputable and, and, and competent uh, vendors, um, just because you've outsourced work to them, like it doesn't mean it'll end well automatically. Uh, my experience is sure. that working with vendors, like you really need to, you need to engage in the selection and you need to stay in touch with them uh, regularly and make sure that, you know, basically almost like treat them like um, they're an employee who happens to be getting uh, paid from a different source um, and make make sure that their uh, you know their focus and attention is on the uh, the items that you feel need to be focused on um, so uh, I, I've I've actually seen examples of medtech companies who um, have really taken this to almost a, an extreme I, I know one company uh, which is actually moving along quite well um, but best I can tell, the only permanent employee of the company is actually the CEO. I mean, they've, uh, they've outsourced to a number of different design companies. They've outsourced their regulatory. They've outsourced their manufacturing. Um, it, it, it's really very lean and mean. Um, but they've, they've actually managed to move quite quickly and get a lot done. Uh, I'm definitely, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say I'm a firm believer in being lean and mean when you're doing a startup to in order to be nimble. And one of the things that people can take advantage of, again, going to academic institutions, so many have incubators and they're providing so much of the infrastructure to assist you, as well as you have an incredible supply of brain power uh, to rely on. And so they're they're a great place to uh, talk to your local university, et cetera. And Naomi, within industry, uh, you have something similar, don't you, for uh, as an incubator? Well, we work with incubators, so, so we um, have a lot of partnerships with them. But I think um, just, just to follow up on something that, that Niles said, it's really important to select um, you know, your partners, whether they're vendors, um, other associates, et cetera, very carefully. Um, and, um, you know, we do a lot of, uh, of support. So we've had, um, we support very large organizations that choose to be um, uh, completely um, very nimble and outsource everything. Also, maybe startups that do that. And then we have some companies uh, within incubators that really want to develop their own IP and their own know-how. Um, so there's a lot of resources for that. One of the most important things is to um, choose your partners, um, whether it's a CMO or anything like that, 
where you have very open communication, very explicit um, uh, expectations, and um, and you're right. You don't know. Uh, I've seen some really good partnerships and some not so good. Um, but as far as academia, there's a lot of uh, wonderful incubators that uh, will support you. And like you said, Bob, they have so many resources now um, to offer and and the connections and the networking and all of that. So I agree. And there's also uh, money's available. So money is always a critical element as you're doing a startup. For instance, here in Pens uh, Pennsylvania, we have the uh, Ben Franklin program. And so this one can provide startup funds uh, with no very little strings attached, I should say. But again, in conjunction with incubators, this is a way to ratchet up quickly, get some of those much needed funds. Uh, it's not going to be huge. Uh, but you're talking maybe a hundred thousand dollars, and that will go a long ways for addressing some of your initial legal costs and other types of uh, costs we, you you may have with intellectual properties. Yeah, we just actually finished up a round. Um, it was uh, a, a U.S. Uh, grant uh, that we offer. We do it yearly, and it was it's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But it's not just the money, but it's also the expertise. So. We provide a process development scientists and a lot of the experts that we offer uh, along with samples and services. So there's a lot of those type of grants available. Um, and as again, I can't say much. There's a lot of really great resources to tap into. And, you know, from the audience, if you're out there, the first thing is just build your network, start reaching out to similar, um, you know, groups and get connections, learn from others um, and and ask questions. I think there's uh, so many people that are willing to offer, you know, uh, you know, an hour of conversation. What do you think? What's not without giving up all your trade secrets or anything like that. But it's great to build those partnerships early. Naomi, that sounds like a really interesting program. Can can you just for the audience tell them like what your due dates, uh, uh, when would they have to have applications in? How what are the uh, logistics of it? Uh, we just finished it. Oh, I feel so bad because it's a teaser. Um, so it closed out July first. Uh, we had a lot of great applicants. Um, we have. Um, I think this is like the fourth year we do this. We do it one in Europe. Uh, Asia and um, the United States, and um, I think it's a, a great resource. Uh, one of my uh, clients was one, we had three winners last year, and within six months, they were able to develop um, very optimized, I should say, a, a whole process that can now be commercialized uh, for a vaccine. So um, I think just knowing that you can tap on really good, reliable vendors that will offer you process development scientists. They're not there to make the sale, but to, to offer the data. The data is going to drive your growth, and you have to build that and the know-how. Um, so you, you have all kinds of trainings, et cetera. But it is, I mean, unfortunately, it just closed. But there'll be another one next year. So keep in touch. <laughs> And I would imagine you require they put together an informational deck when they're first uh, applying or doing something, but they need to um, have their logic. And again, it would go pretty much what we're speaking about today um, that goes into their exit strategies, what they're looking at. So there's yeah. a type of informational deck. Yeah, so um, out of uh, all of the entries, we have to choose 10, which is not easy. I'm glad we have a whole scientific panel, so uh, nobody could pay me to win. Um, but uh, obviously it's for the whole, uh, all of, of uh, the United States. But um, so they put together, really the entry's easy. It's, um, you know, what are the biggest challenges? Tell me about, you know, your, your product, your molecule. Um, how do you think we can help? Um, and then they have to present the winners then, or the, the uh, runners up, I don't know how to say that, the, the 
qualifying or the people who have chosen the 10 people, they have to create a deck and they do have um, a uh, quick fire presentation um, to present their molecule, their business, um, and their challenges. And I think it's great experience, um, you know, to do that. And I think there's other groups, I think Launch Bio, uh, or I don't know, a few other um, uh, incubators are offering similar things. And you should tap into that because you can learn from others and how to present. And, and, um, and also another very, quick aspect to bring it back to this topic is how do you plan to scale? And um, that is a really important um, piece. Yes, and again, so if I would encourage the audience as you're starting this, putting together a deck and having to address these issues, how are you going to scale? Uh, what is your exit strategy? All those things will force you to have to consider these issues and then present it to potential investors. And they will definitely tell you where you're lacking, which areas uh, that you need to build up. But it's a great exercise just from your own um, edification of where you might be weak, where you might need to up your team, et cetera. I guess yeah, one I think I, I just want to quickly, quickly, oh, go ahead, there was a question. I'm, yes, from the audience, um, Todd asks, and it's related here, what is the role of the board of directors in planning to scale? I think um, many members of board of directors would say that they're, uh, I mean, they, they often represent the shareholder, right? Um, they often represent a group of investors and uh, I get the sense that, um, you know, I think the board of directors are often there to help kind of remind the startup, you know, that um, if you step back for a minute, like, are they actually making progress toward, towards the exit? Um, you know, I guess it can, be, uh, it can be difficult in sort of the heat of battle uh, to recognize whether you're moving, moving forward or sideways. Um, so I, 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 I know one uh, active board member, he, he feels that his, uh, his main role is to kind of remind the CEO <laughs> that, um, you know, the whole purpose of the enterprise is, is to actually exit. Uh, I, I'm not sure how representative he is of uh, boards in general, but that's, that's one perspective that he's made clear to me. And that, of course, is the transition you have to make in a startup when you incorporate and you'll have your founders uh, who may or may not be part of their overall board structure. And then you need to establish this board, which has, um, as Niall was saying, it has a related but also this they must report to the shareholders. So it's an interesting dimension and you have to transition yeah from one to another as you're growing this startup. Right. And I, I think it's also, you know, they're there to make sure that um, you are building and moving in the right direction, as you mentioned. You're, you're um, showing um, pertinent data, showing that, that uh, I, I guess, confirmation that this is a good investment and this is the right way to go. So um, I think it's uh it's a little challenging sometimes but sure. yep. I, I i think it's a good question because it actually helps you uh figure out the kind of people that you'd really kind of want on a startup board um because if it's about the exit like i think you need people who um uh you know can think strategically uh, who understand the industry that you're trying to exit into. And I think some board members, like you, you really want them to uh, have contacts in that industry so that they can, they can set up the conversations and set up the contacts that uh, you can connect with people er early. Because I, I think an exit doesn't happen all of a sudden. Uh, you know, I, I think Bob alluded to this earlier. Um, you need to be working and partnering with companies um, so that they, they get to know you and you get to know them. 
and then eventually if an exit makes sense it's uh, more likely to happen and i think the board the, the boards can help uh, just set those connections up i guess you, uh, you know a, a good segue um is is to also um have these things in balance right so you're you're thinking about your overall strategy and how you're going to do the startup and you have your technical hat on, you also have to have your business hat on. Um, and so having these connections and uh, inputs, you know, make sure that you're stay in line with that overall path. And also another consideration with this is who are your shareholders? So often with a startup, what do you have that you're going to be able to bring in um, some of the talent that you need and you're going to have to give up equity in your corporation? And so now you have to decide between preferred stock and common stock. And so who the shareholders are, in some respects, you as a founder are going to be dictating who they are, how they are, how diverse they are, and that presents different challenges then going forward and especially when you get to the point of how you're actually going to exit right so, so i'm sorry excuse me a question again from the audience um this one from sanjeev he's asking um relative to exits um does it matter um with respect to attracting funding and or an exit whether or not you have a design patent or product patent so it's a weaving in both our patent discussion and our exit discussion here. Yeah, I, I think um, I'll sort of go, go back to what I said earlier. I, I think any patent, whether it's design or product, um, what matters is the degree to which it gives you exclusivity. Exactly. Um, and I mean, like, the, just so that we're sort of intellectually honest, like there are companies who are very successful and exit and um, they don't have any patents, um, but they're they're trading more in the fact that they're a first mover advantage. Like I would say, Google and Amazon are those kind of companies, right? Um, but I think in the life science field, certainly in the med tech field, um, uh, just because it all kind of moves a little bit slower, I think patents uh, matter. Um, so I, I, whoever asked the question, I. I I think it really you have to look at how much of a barrier to your patent uh, does it present to other people coming in. Um, and that's that's probably more important whether uh, than whether it's a. My experience is that design patents tend to be certainly easier to design around. They, you know, like it's, it's design patents to me are a little bit like sort of the, the style of a product rather than the actual substance. I have a, a couple of questions I'm going to combine here, and the essence of the question, and I think this one might be for Naomi with respect to therapeutics, um, can you talk about the role of the data package in the acquisition process or partnering process? I think that's, that's really important. First of all, you know, having a strong um, uh, data package or, 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 you know, accumulation of uh, making sure, showing, you know, how well your product has been um, designed, how it's been uh, uh, developed, et cetera, that, um, that really gives you a lot of value. Um, and, you know, especially when you're doing pitches and things like that, it's really important not to, you know, everybody has that dream and that, that, um, that vision of, of how we're going to cure the world or et cetera like that. But the data is the meat of the pro of the project, and um, I don't know if I'm veering off of too much, but it's really important when you're coming from an academic lab and you have a bench scale type process um, that you are thinking how is this going to translate into commercialization, and can you do it? Um, so a lot of times you have um, process steps like. Um, you know, ultrafiltration, or not ultrafiltration, but centrifugation, or um, uh, different uses of, of chemicals that you can't apply later on. So that whole holistic look at, you know, where you're at 
and where you're going is going to create that very valuable package to help you, um, you know, create the interest and the partnership. Um, and if you're concerned about it, I think it's good to have those reviews um, with some, uh, you know, industry uh, leaders, uh, even vendors are, are willing to help with you. Hopefully that answers it a little bit. So maybe Bob, you might be able to add to it. Well, an, another critical aspect of this uh, we haven't touched on is the uh, regulatory framework. Yeah. And so in order to obtain any of the things that we're talking about require some types of approvals, whether it's FDA, uh, EPA approvals, and data is critical uh, to obtaining those types of approvals and actually can end up being um, some of your longer term requirements. So for some approvals, it could take several years to get the final authorizations that you need. Uh, right now with the COVID, uh, they're issuing uh, uh, emergency use authorizations right. just That's to that. allow people to be able to expedite these types of things. But data is critical uh, in obtaining those very important uh, approvals. Yeah, and I think it's, it's very critical that you look at, um, you know, the, the details of your process. Um, I, have, I can't tell you how many times, you know, people are ready to move ahead and they realize that, you know, they can't use so much part of their process that they've developed. They have to go back and rework it for those specific things that you mentioned, Bob, that they're not acceptable. There's a lot of chemicals that can't be used in a process, not acceptable in a process. Those things that, um, you know, they have to meet regulatory uh, requirements. And actually, I, you know, that's a very important thing is, you know, the FDA is very open to having you come in and ask questions. Um, and, and you shouldn't be scared of that. You should look at also organizations like the DDA. Um, I was like a past vice president of uh, the local uh, metro chapter, the PDA chapter. Um, and we've constantly got a lot of uh, questions about from startups and other companies. And, it's, you know, it's more important to ask and to have the, that, those communications and, you know, discussions than to wait until it really can hurt you and then you're, you have to start over. Yes, and, and just a little side note, because, again, there's there's all these little potential pitfalls that things we may not be cognizant of. So for instance, in the medical field, we typically, the first go-to is the FDA, but there are some other little potentials. So I'll just say a product like Clorox. If you'll look on the label, there actually is required by law. Uh, there's a labeling law in the United States. Whenever you say that you're going to kill something, as in a pesticide, rodenticide, et cetera, uh, you're required to get an EPA uh, approval under the federal uh, regulation called FIFRA, um, and it stands for Fungicide, Insecticide, uh, Rodenticide Act. And so it's one that people often overlook, and yet they can very quickly run a, a, a rye of the law uh, because this is a labeling requirement that you would have to have on certain types of products. I mean, that, that being said, I think it's important for, you know, people to start, you know, develop, I mentioned this before, develop your network, start partnering, ask those questions, um, and connect um, so, so that, you know, it, it's very easy to be in your bubble and you're just focused on your, your molecule and um, the technology of it and everything, but to, to start branching out to these important areas, you know, uh, regulatory, commercialization, the legal aspect, um, and don't take it all on yourself. You know, partner with uh, reputable people, uh, people that you can trust, um, and and watch. You know, your your IT too. Seems like yes. a lot. Do this, do this, do this, but you can do it. You can do it. Yes, but again, Naomi, as you outlined. That's why partnering is so critical. Um, there, it is so difficult for a startup to bring in all the talent that you will need. But by partnering with some of these larger organizations, um, you can do, in Naomi's case, there's a corporation 
who has the expertise for what needs to be done in regulatory environments, et cetera. And I'm sure that's something as those applicants uh, propose, uh, your team will very quickly point out um, that they may be lacking in certain areas or where they would need to go for regulatory approval. So a, a critical help uh, that many startups need. Yeah, we, we call that connecting the dots. We want to make sure, you know, I, I can't be the expert in everything, so I can connect you with a regulatory person, you know, or, um, you know, you guys can connect others with your specialty. So um, that is very critical, definitely. Outsource if you can, but do it carefully and partner as much as you can. Niall, do you have anything more? Actually, I was just reflecting on, I, I'd echo your sentiment that, um, you didn't use these words, but it, it, it's like, I think probably the biggest problem that you have to overcome probably wasn't on your radar when you started. So you, you need to be sort of um, externally focused. And I, I agree, I think talking to people, connecting the dots is a good way to become aware. Um, and I think, frankly, sort of uh, to try to foster a curiosity. Um, I, 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 like rarely the problem that stumps you is the one that you've been aware of for the last five years. <laughs> the one that stumps you is the one like, oh, I never even thought of that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, just to use your phrase, to get out of the bubble, I, I think it's a very healthy thing. And to, um, you know, tap into other people and to look at the, uh, um, to look at what you're trying to do from different perspectives, because that's um, that's often where the curveball comes from. Yes, as someone once uh, posed it, uh, it's what you don't know that you don't know, and so uh, oh, yeah. uh, that oh. becomes a critical. <laughs> you know, you don't know how many times you said you don't know what you don't know all the I time. So, um, th th we were. Um, we're nearly, our time is nearly up. I, I just wondered if we wanted to touch off a little bit on um, the topic of equity. Um, or do you guys have more to say on uh, uh, on the regulatory stuff? No, I, I think that's fine. Again, uh, the regulatory is one that, you know, the focus here, we were looking at uh, uh, if it's a medical application, you know, people are going to be oriented towards one direction. And so it's difficult. Uh, you have to look at the specific needs of whatever the product, uh, the technology that they're doing to understand uh, where and how that needs to be applied regulatory from a regulatory standpoint. And that's where that outside expertise needs. But I, I think we could go ahead and move on if that's uh, where you'd like to go. Sure. That's um I think often we get questions, uh, especially with early stage companies around uh, equity and how to divide it and how to utilize it. Um, I guess, um, you know, I, I, this could take up a whole hour, but I, I, like one um, aspect of equity, which strikes me is, um, you know, th is it like, I put it this way, there could be a problem if you know three people start a company and the idea is that they're going to develop a product, let's say over three years. And um, you know, let's say the chief technology officer for some reason needs to leave halfway through that. Um, so like you really don't want that person to leave with all the equity that they'd originally been assigned, because you need to have some equity in hand to um, reward somebody to come in and sort of finish finish the job. And um, so this is often referred to, you know, you'll hear people talk about uh, vesting schedules or restricted or unrestricted stock. Um, and they're just mechanisms to help you kind of avoid that uh, situation where, um, uh, you know, somebody may have equity sort of coming to them in anticipation of a milestone being met. Um, but you want a mechanism in place to make sure that uh, if the milestone is not met, uh, which can be for very valid reasons, um, that the company is uh, is still in a position to sort of finish the job. Um, and I think that that's, a, that's an aspect that um, often gets overlooked early in a company uh, where 
essentially 100% of the equity is being assigned and you know maybe only 5% of the actual work has been done so most of it's been assigned based on you know an anticipation of what people are going going to do it, and it also may be assigned uh, you may want to be a minority owned business and so you have 51% that may be going to a particular area. So there may be some other constraints that you're working with, and then you're looking at that other percentage of how you're going to divide that up. And, and it is very critical if some, for whatever reason, uh, it could be anything from a death to uh, an unexpected someone leaves to go to a, a, another opportunity, and suddenly you see that equity departing. So uh, it is definitely a critical element to it. I guess overall, it really brings that you have to think of the situation and you have to look at it from all different aspects. And you have to always ask, what if? And obviously, you want to protect your, your company, you want to protect uh, your IP and your technology, make sure you can withstand the, the test of, of time and challenge. There's, there's a related aspect too that can tie in, and that is uh, uh, there may be with your technology, the opportunity to do licensing uh, where you will re receive royalties back. And again, how they come to the corporation and, and again, those people who are equity partners, uh, how that is divided up among them. So you have some additional financial considerations with those types of structured deals. I'm afraid, uh, panelists, we have come to the close of, of our hour here. Um, we thank you um, very much for your time and your expertise sharing that with, with us today. Um, we hope that you uh, found this an enjoyable experience as well. Um, before we close, I'd like to once again thank our sponsors, MVM Associates, Cesare Raviz, and you, you, excuse me, University Place Associates. Um, and I'd also just uh, like a, to say a word about BioStrategy Partners. Um, we are known for this practical knowledge series as well as our Germinator program um, in both of these programs are designed to accelerate commercialization of early stage technologies. And we hope that you'll take a peek at our website at biostrategypartners.org to learn more and to uh, review other panels in the library. And with that, um, thank you everyone and enjoy your weekend. Great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.